Okay, let's get going. Um, hi everyone, welcome to the, this webinar for the Beef and Lamb Central Otago Farming for Profit program. I'm Nicola Chisholm and I'll be the technical host and facilitator for today's webinar. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to provide you with information about the Otago Regional Council's proposed plan change H, which was released earlier this month. Uh, this is an interim plan change, which will eventually be superseded by the new Land and Water Regional Plan, which addresses, um, and this, uh, this plan change addresses known deficiencies in the current plan, specifically around nutrient allocation, winter crop stock exclusion, setbacks, and effluent systems. So a lot of stuff that's quite relevant to farming. Um, Lauren Phillips is the Beef and Lamb Environment Policy Manager for the South Island and today she's going to take us through the contents of Plan Change 8 um, and she's also going to touch on relevant parts of Plan Change 1 which has also just come out as well. Um, she's also going to provide some guidance and allude to some resources um, which will help you with making a submission on these plan changes. Um, and she's also going to touch on what's happening with Plan Change 7, um, which addresses the replacement of beam first. Uh, that's all from me. I'm now going to hand over to Lauren. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, I guess um, we don't have a lot of time today, but we've got heaps to get through. So. When we get to questions, we're going to be trying to answer farmers' questions first, because obviously they're paying for my time right now. Um, and then we'll try and get to consultants second, but that is going to be, if you see um, that maybe we don't end up with time for your question, then you'll know why. If you don't manage to get your question answered today, you're welcome to email it through to me, and my address is um, going to be on these presentation slides. Now, is this sharing properly? Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay, so first of all, uh, the most important thing in your life is people, and that includes yourself. You're important too. So if you are not okay, please seek help. We're living in particularly interesting times. You've had wave after wave of regulation hitting you. You've had droughts, um, Southland's had floods. You guys had floods actually close to Christmas or Easter, didn't you? Um, you've had my uh, Embovis, and now the world has completely turned inside out. Everything has changed. We do not have any certainty, certainty and it might never go back to normal. So right now, nobody expects you to be okay. So if you're not, that's normal. And if you're not, and you don't feel like you can talk to the people around you, for whatever reason, maybe they've got too much in their own plate as well, there are people you can talk to. If it's a mate, if it's a relative, call the Rural Support Trust as well. They're there for you as well, all right? And they're still operating. You don't have to carry this by yourself. That's really important and you are really important. So look after yourself and look after each other. Now, today we're going to be touching on some national policy just so that you know where it's going. Then I'm gonna to explain to you how all of this fits together because I know there's a bit of confusion and we're gonna look at the process that you're gonna be facing in the near future. We're going to touch on plan change seven, touch on plan, plan change one, and get into some detail with plan change eight. Then we're going to look at how to do submissions. We're going to do some submission help, and then we're going to get to questions at the end. That is one of my cows who uh, broke down a fence to eat my native shelf dog. So in terms of national policy, policy, there's three things that are sort of mainly on people's minds at the moment. That's climate change, essential fresh water package, and the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity. So climate change is a whole bunch of moving parts, mainly legislation, so law. And right now, you don't have another opportunity just at the moment to influence how things go further from here. Now, Beef and Lamb has been very much on the government's case about the ETS, the Emissions Trading Scheme, and what we've said is there needs to be a cap on how much you can offset. Your emissions. So basically, we, we're talking about sort of um, in New Zealand uh, carbon farming. There's, there needs to be a, a cap um, on how much you can do that without actually having to actually change how much emissions you are producing. The government says no, but maybe in the future they want to try and do this through the Resource Management Act. We're saying no, you need to do it through the actual climate change work. This is um, not really sort of sensible. What we are currently doing is working with primary industry through um, Hewaka Ekonoa. And that's basically, you got two options through one of the pieces of legislation, which was either we just tax you guys, 
all primary industries comes up with a solution on how to deal with um, uh, climate emissions from the agricultural sector. So that's what we're working on now, and there's some milestones. If you wanna know about climate change, I'm not the person to ask. There's an email address for Dylan Mugridge, and he's our climate change nerd. Please ask him all the stuff, that's great, he loves it, I don't. Essential fresh water, you probably remember putting in a submission about essential fresh water um, in the middle of lambing and calving um, not so long ago. This is with the ministers now and they're expecting for it to become operative or to sort of land before the elections. As soon as it becomes operative, that means it's in force. And the councils will have to um, pretty much work to include all of this and be running up and running with all of this within five years. That's quite a big ask because they've got to do the science, they've got to do the consultation, they've got to do, they've got to do a lot of parts um, before they can make that happen. And then lastly, hopefully you guys do know something about the NPS for Biodiversity, even if you didn't attend one of the workshops this summer. It was supposed to happen now, but we're probably looking at sort of summer through to um, April next year. So um, after elections at any rate, which means, which does give you a bit of a breather in some ways. Um, remember that when the national policy statement for biodiversity lands, that's only the first stage. The second stage is it needs to be made into rules at a regional and district level. So you will get more opportunity to have your say in how this pans out for you in your area. Now, how does this all fit together? Because I understand that quite a few are sort of going, well, why am I here? Because I've already put in a submission on fresh water. Why is this happening to me? And you don't understand where this is all coming from. So really what we've had for a while now is the Resource Management Act. And if I can give you sort of a pointer for the Resource Management Act, the, the RMA is the one ring to bind them all, the one ring to rule them all, the one ring to find them, et cetera, et cetera. That's the RMA. And then under that, we've had regional plans for a while. We've also had district plans. And they get their um, obligations from the Resource Management Act. But since then, you've seen the National Policy Statement for Freshwater, which is why we've had so many changes around the country. And then more recently, we had the Freshwater Package. And then hopefully you did notice the NPS for Biodiversity slide in there. At this stage, you're probably thinking, yeah, but how does this actually make sense? Like, what am I supposed to be paying attention to, et cetera, et cetera? And so either you're now anxious and overwhelmed or I've lost you and um, the monkey's banging symbols inside your brain, you're not actually listening anymore. I completely understand. This is how it fits together. Again, not so helpful, but if you basically sort of look at it at a point of view of, it's all about who makes it and then who enforces it. And ultimately it tends to bottleneck at around the regional or district level. So government, makes all of that middle layer of stuff. And then the regional council either has to turn it into rules or they have to um, just enforce it as it is. And here's, ooh, sorry, here's a key um, to help you to understand how it all works. What you just need to take away from it is there is a lot more to your life now than there used to be. The policy toilet is very complicated and it will get easier, but at this stage, ultimately enforced by your regional council. And if you don't get involved at the high levels, what comes out of the regional council is going to be much harder to, um, to live with. So that's how it all fits together. You're wel welcome to ask me for more detail um, at a d later stage, but at this point, we're just going to move on. So normally when you have a plan change to your regional plan or to your district plan, you go through a process. And so these first three boxes are basically, they do the science, they talk to you guys, they do some consultation, and then they go away and they cook up a draft plan that fixes some problems. And that's, the, that's and then they put it out to you guys and they say, here, what do you think? And you get to put in submissions on it. And once you put in your submissions, you get to go to a hearing where you tell commissioners why you said what you said. You get to explain your, your submissions. It's a really good opportunity, especially if you're not so good at writing to basically get your point of view across. And then the commissioners give their recommendations to the council who go away and make changes. And they put out what they hope is a final plan. It's not always a final plan though, because sometimes you look at it and you're like, nah, I don't like it. 
So usually you then go to the environment court and you say to the environment court, I don't like this. And then the judges will make a decision and that will either become the new plan or you'll say again, no, I don't like that. And you'll go to the high court and they will then make a decision on that. You could potentially go further than the high court, but I would never like to see um, farmers doing that because it's a huge waste of your money. But that's the normal process. However, for you guys, it's a bit different because Otago Regional Council asked the minister to have the plan change called in. And the minister agreed. So the plan change has actually been um, called in and it's going through the Environment Protect uh, the Environment Protection Authority now, which means your process is a bit shorter. It's not scary, it's fine. Now, it's been a bit interesting with plan change, seven and plan change, um, the omnibus plan change, because essentially the minister did some work before this to establish whether or not he was happy with the Otago plans and how to manage this. And he decided he wasn't. And so although the council was in the process with some other things, especially with deemed permits, um, that kind of was um, truncated and they had to hurry it up and so the, the normal sort of science and um, consultation stuff is a bit fuzzier. For the omnibus plan change particularly, I, I do wonder where some of these parts are, but now we've got to the point where the plan has been notified. So because it's been called in, this has been handed over to the EPA, which means you're dealing with the EPA now, not the council. So this has been notified and you are now at the submission stage where you get to have your say on how you feel about this. After that, instead of going to the commissioners, you're just going to go straight to the environment court. Don't be afraid of this. This is actually fine. This is not so scary. You don't have to be a lawyer to do this. You, the, the judges are going to understand, look, these are farmers. They're not going to speak law. They're not going to speak planning. They're going to speak to their submissions. And it's actually going to be really valuable for you to go and educate environment court judges on how farming actually works and plays out in the real world. So now, if um, if the environment court comes to a decision and somebody doesn't like that decision, then they can appeal that to the high court. There you do need a lawyer. Otherwise, it goes straight through to the plan change um, and you get your new plan. So that's the, the process that you're going to have now. Remember that you're dealing with the EPA now. You're not dealing with ORC anymore. So we're not going to spend too much time on plan change seven because this was actually notified before it was called in. Um, and we held uh, some webinars during lockdown. Now, all of the webinar presentation stuff is on a website. You've got the link there in front of you and Laura will put it onto uh, the chat now, I think. Um, basically, this plan change is supposed to be a way to band-aid the deemed permit situation because they don't want to put out a new plan, which they have to do. You are going to be getting a new plan in future. They don't want to put out a new plan when they've got a whole bunch of people with brand new permits and they actually need to um, reduce the water allocations because then they're stuck with an over allocation or they're stuck with a, a, a take regime that is not going to um, let them fulfill their environmental obligations. So they want short term um, uh, resource consents so that by the time the plan change is finished, these resource consents are coming due and they can get them updated according to what they're allowed to do in the, in the new plan. So what they've proposed is, proposed is a controlled activity resource consent. And that's a good thing because controlled activity means that as long as you tick the boxes, you're going to get your resource consent. Now, unfortunately, there are some real fish hooks that you need to be aware of the, in this. So if you did not put in a submission on this, I would suggest that you do. Um, and our submission, the Beef and Lamb submission, is on the website now that Laura will have seen through. So the fish hooks are that um, what they've done in this is sort of take this as an opportunity to um, more than just band-aid the deemed permit situation. They're, gonna, they're trying to claw back water allocation and they're also trying to lock in and claw back some nutrient losses because water and nutrient loss kind of go hand in hand. So what you could be facing is losing some of your allocation when you get this controlled activity consent um, and um, you would be locked down to uh, some baseline averages, 
which can be problematic if those um, years were not or either not um, representative of your system for one reason or another or because your system has changed since then so for example um, it locks you down to uh, your 17 18 year for some things um, for example um, i think just off the top of my head that was um, land area and irrigation and so if you've put in more develop or you've, or you've developed your property more within your existing water take that is going to be a problem for you and if you can't tick the boxes on this controlled activity you would be looking at a non-complying activity and a non-complying activity is quite serious because non-complying means you're not supposed to be doing that it's not a particularly easy resource consent to get and it is an expensive one to apply for and they can look at anything they want to in determining whether or not you should be getting a resource consent so it is very serious um, and it does represent two-thirds of uh, the water takes in Otago is the people who will be um, expiring before we've got a new plan change in a new plan in place. So again, if you haven't put in a submission, please do. We've got slides, we've got um, the beef and lamb submission up online. So if you want to have a look, it doesn't need to be as fancy as that. I mean, this is my job, so I do it. Yours doesn't need to be anywhere near as fancy. You could just speak exactly from your perspective and from your own experience. But it does need to be in by 5 p.m. on 17 August. If you've already put in a submission, don't do anything. You don't need to do a thing. If you haven't, you need to send it into the addresses that we put up on the website. You need to send it to the EPA and to the, um, the council, even though the council isn't necessarily handling this so much anymore. So plan change one is part of Omnibus. And there's two parts. The one is around um, sort of ma the main things for you to see are around um, waste oil where you, where you either are disposing of it incorrectly or where you're using it as a dust suppressant. They don't really want you doing that anymore. Um, so have a look at that. I'm not sure how much that will affect you for your daily operations, but it might be something to keep in mind for future. And if you really don't like it, then put in a submission on it. Part seven um, puts in changes around um, landfills, but it doesn't appear to apply to offal pits and landfills. However, there is stuff in plan change eight that will affect you. So in front of you, you've got two pictures. You've got an offal pit on your left and a rubbish pit on your right. And I'm gonna give you 10, cents, 10 seconds to think about what is wrong with those offal pits and um, rubbish pits. Oh, Laura says, can you put that on the chat, please? Be really interested to see what you think. And for any um, people from Otago there who are sort of wandering with eagle eyes, uh, this is not Otago Farm. Right, I'm giving you the answers now. So on the left, the offal pit, um, you can see rubbish in the pit, which is a big no for an awful pit. You can also see chemical containers. Those were ag chem and animal health chemical containers. Also a big no, there's not proper disposal of those. What you can't see in that picture is that it was actually um, about three or four meters away from a waterway. And because that was um, so close to the waterway and because it was on quite gravelly loose soils, you could see a difference between the water quality before it hit that um, uh, offal pit and after it hit it, there was a big difference. So that is not good management practice. You don't put rubbish in your offal pit, you definitely don't put chemical um, containers in it and you do not have it so close to a water body. And good management practice is something that is probably going to become part of your life in the very near future. So start thinking about your offal pits at home. On your right, you've got the rubbish pit. Now this was not near any water bodies. Um, I didn't see any hazardous substances in it at the time. The problem with this pit is that I'm not sure if you can see the scorch marks, but they occasionally burn it. And that is not necessarily good practice either. And in some areas, it's not actually allowed. So in this area where this farm was, that was not allowed. They're not allowed to do that. They, they thought they were doing a great thing. Unfortunately, super not. Good, not good management practice. And these are the kinds of things you might find yourself getting pinged on in the future. So start thinking about um, your waste disposal. Now, plan change eight has five parts, which are, sorry, six parts, which are more or less relevant to you. 
um, as farmers. And these are discharge policies, effluent storage and application, good farming practices, which is synonymous with good management practices, intensive farming stock exclusion and sediment traps. So we're not gonna spend any time on part B, the effluent storage today. I'm aware that um, a lot of you guys do have feed pads, standoff pads, um, some of you housed your stock. And if I have any deer farmers on today, I know that there are quite a few housed, sort of winter housed deer um, operations in the area. So you should probably check that out because there will be some changes um, uh, heading your way. Now, generally policies are confusing because they're not rules, but for some reason they're there to tell people their thoughts and feelings and life intentions. This is how I used to feel as well. However, the thing about policies is that they can be a way of sneaking a sort of rule in. And they also, they also guide rules. So you have to pay attention to them because it's all very well to change the rule, but if the policy stays the same and it pretty much says the same thing, then how the rule gets interpreted and applied will still have to fall into line with that policy. So keep an eye on your policies. Now, discharge policies, is very fun and um, under 7D, Power 7D, we've got some really interesting ones for you guys. So we're looking at farm nitrogen discharges and the four points that really stood out um, for me uh, when thinking of how to explain this to you guys was that um, when they're looking at a discharge, the, the changes proposed, when they're looking at a discharge for a consent, they must look at the um, sensitivity of the land and water, right? But this wording is um, is quite broad because it says any particular sensitivity and any receiving water. And as soon as I see any receiving water or any water, water body, I think, well, does this include, I don't know, um, a stock water pond? Does it include a disconnected pond um, with no ecological value? In which case, why are we trying to protect this? Um, that sort of thing. So it is a bit of um, a blank check. And then the second one um, was th that um, they were looking to do ongoing reductions of adverse environmental effects of discharge. Now, obviously, we do want to reduce um, the adverse uh, effects of discharges on the environment. However, up to one point, because if you did attend any of the biodiversity things, you know that I hate blank checks, obviously, unless I'm the one receiving them. Um, but if I'm not the one receiving them, I hate blank checks because this gives license to act indiscriminately and um, arbitrarily. So the problem with the word ongoing is that the rest of the policies don't set a floor. So when can you stop making these reductions? Because that, that does give council um, the license to basically require reductions until they feel like it. So where, where can you feel safe? Is it at the point where you no longer have any animals on? Or is it at the point where you, um, with, you know, one isolated um, person within council exercises their own discretion and says, now you're good? This is too broad and there is no flaw. You get no, you get no sort of indication of where you can stop. And that can be quite dangerous. So the other one is to avoid potentially significant adverse effects. And yes, we don't want um, significant adverse effects, but the word avoid is very strong because avoid doesn't mean I'm going to avoid doing it like I'm going to try not to do it. It means you're not allowed to. That's a no. You're not allowed to have um, potentially significant adverse effects. So it is quite a big deal. And it is, again, um, quite a broad power that's being given. Um, and then the last one, and this is one where I'm not so sure that people are necessarily um, paying that much attention to these kinds of things, but you're going to need to in the future, because this allows for 10 year resource consent durations for discharges, and that's nitrogen discharges. At the moment, your rules basically set a floor discharge of 15 kgs of nitrogen per hectare per year in some areas, 20 in other areas, and I think it was 30 in all the rest of the areas. So you've basically got a floor of, if you're operating under that, you're a permitted activity, you just carry on. You know, as long as you stay under that, you're good. This one says, if you're over that by a certain amount, like you're looking at the people or the farmers who um, their systems are leaching a, a quite a bit. They're not, they're not within the floor. They're leaching quite a bit. They're gonna need a resource consent for this, and it's gonna lock in their nitrogen losses. 
there are problems with this because this would come into force before we've got a new plan. So you're going to have 10 year resource consents which will outlive the new plan and they're going to lock in the highest leeches which means that when they go to, that, go to make the new plan and they're calculating, okay, well, we've got this much nitrogen in the water and we have to reduce it by this amount. So everybody else has to reduce how much they're leaching from their farms by this, blah, blah, blah. They're basically working out, okay, how much nitrogen is there in the bucket for everybody to share? That consented amount is taken out the bucket already, which means there is less in that bucket for all of the rest of you to share. So if you guys are going to have to make cuts, you're going to make cuts with that lower amount. And that, that stuff that's consented, that's protected until afterwards. So that's kind of a big deal. And we've seen this before um, in other parts of the country, which is trying, why I'm trying to bring it to your attention. Because this can affect not only your system, but the viability of your farm into the future. Now, um, if I was going to focus on two things as a farmer, in order to like, you know, in, in terms of things that are easy to get your head around, these two with the stars are the ones where I'd say that's where your biggest bang for buck is. There are other provisions in here which talk about sediment quite a lot. And one of the secrets in policy is anytime you see a focus on sediment, that's a target on a sheep and beef farmer's back, basically. Sediment equals sheep and beef. Even though studies have proven that um, most sediment loss comes well, the greater um, amount of sediment loss comes from an intensive dairy farm. Sheep and beef, your main contaminant losses are sediment and phosphorus. And so that's what you need to be aware of a sediment. That's a big red flag for you. Just like if you're, um, if you're seeing the word E. coli, sheep farmers need to start paying attention because as soon as E. coli comes up, sheep stock exclusion from water bodies starts to come up. So yeah, that's an easy sort of shorthand for you. Now, I keep going on about grandparenting, and you guys might not even know what I'm talking about. So I've given you an, um, a Canterbury example, a hypothetical example, which is that Lisa's farm leaches an average of seven kgs of nitrogen per hectare per year. That's an average. Bart's farm leaches an average of 60 kgs of N per hectare per year. And ECAN, ECAN's got their obligations under the National um, Policy Statement for Fresh Water. So they decide, okay, well, we have to reduce the, the nitrogen in the water by this much. So how are we going to do this is just lock everyone down to what they're doing in a baseline year. And no one's allowed to go above that and they need to make reductions until we reach that amount into, um, of, of N in the water. So that's what, they're, that's what they're doing. They've grandparented the nutrients and you have to reduce your losses by 10% to meet the, the, to meet the target. So essentially you can't make changes to your farm if it's going to put your nitrogen losses up, regardless of what your nitrogen loss originally was. So this means that Lisa on seven cages of N, she has no flexibility in her system anymore because some changes might not put her, change, might not put her N number up that much but it'll put her end number up. And she's not allowed to do that because that would stuff up their accounting system to fix the waterways. But because he's got so much um, in that he's losing, he, wouldn't, he, could, he could do quite a few things to make his system more efficient here and there so that he can make changes. So if he needed to put in a new crop here, maybe he, wouldn't, he just wouldn't take on dairy grazers that year, for example. Or um, if he needed to um, re reduce by 10%, because they all have to reduce by 10%, Losing six kgs out of a 60 kg in per hectare system is not always that hard. It's, I mean, it's not, it's not fun and there might be financial implications, but it's pretty doable. Whereas for Lisa, as soon as you get under about 15 kgs of in, especially if you're dry land, it's not a lot you can do to lose. If you're under 10, then there's bugger all. You can, you can just, you can just uh, write that off. So this is pretty significant for their systems in terms of how this affects their ability to adapt and change and make money. However, it is much more severe for Lisa than it is for Bart, but who do you think ECAN was really worried about in terms of um, how much nitrogen was being lost to the waterways? Do you think there was Lisa on seven or Bart on 60? The real problem with this Canterbury hypothetical story is that it's not hypothetical. Uh, these were my clients 
from when I was consulting. Lisa Farm was losing 15 kgs of N per hectare, and that was irrigated on the flats and dry on the hills. It was a sheep, beef, and dairy grazing system with um, commercial vegetables and also feed wheat. I think it was feed wheat and oats. It was a pretty magnificent farm uh, on 15 kgs of N per hectare. Bart's farm, um, that was actually closer to 200 kgs of N per hectare per year. It was irrigated and intensive, and um, it belonged to a corporation which owned a number of farms. And so these farmers got their nutrient budgets, which I did, back, and they had to put in a consent for um, a consent application for a land use to farm consent. They're locked in. Both of them are locked in. It's pretty obvious between them who's got the more flexibility to fix things and actually make changes to their system between 15 and nearly 200 kgs of N. So what I haven't put into this example is what this meant for them beyond their actual farming system. Pretty much overnight, the lease of farms farm value, land value crashed because the bank no longer had that that sort of view of potential in the farm anymore. The more nitrogen you've got leaching out of your farm, the more potential you have to make changes in your farm. And as soon as that's gone, so is that potential which adds to your land value. And because he had less land value attached to his farm, he had less equity, which means he has less ability to borrow money from the bank, for example. And if he wants to sell the farm, he can't really command the kind of price that he had before. So for him, he had plans to convert um, uh, an area of irrigation that was under an inefficient system. He wanted to put that under pivot to um, make it more efficient, better use of water, less nutrient losses, and it um, would have worked out much better for his crops. However, do you really think the bank wants to loan him all that money for a pivot when his land values just crashed and burned? It's not looking so attractive. Um, whereas for the Bart farm, it was one of several farms that the corporation owned and um, they already had so much fat in their system. They, they also took some land value uh, reduction, but it wasn't nearly on the same scale. And for them, all they had to do, and I know this because at the time I was doing overseer budgets, they, um, I, I didn't do this for them. I understand from their consent. You put in, at the time, you could put in soil moisture sensors. And as soon as you told overseer you'd done that, your nitrogen number would drop. It was a bug. I don't know if they've fixed that yet. I suspect not. Which means that without actually doing anything, they've made much more than their required reductions. Um, so they could actually put in more to their system above that while still having achieved their 10% losses. So that's a really big deal. That is a really big deal. I think if Lisa's farm had done that, they might have achieved some reductions, but not nearly quite as much because they had less to, to start with. And I think what you need to think about is if nutrients are, allocate, are allocated in Otago under a grandparenting system, are you going to be Lisa or are you going to be Bart? So the beef and lamb position, this is a pretty hot topic across the country. The beef and lamb position is basically you're responsible for your own nitrogen, whether you leach seven or whether you leach 200, you are responsible for your own nitrogen. And um, as far as the dry stock se sector is concerned, flexibility is what has kept you alive so far. Um, pretty much if you're farming with your, in your own, within your environmental limits, and that's generally where I think Otago had been aiming for with that floor that they said of 15, 20 and 30, that's where they established the environmental limits were. If you're farming within that, it shouldn't matter if you put in an extra crop, as long as you're still within that floor. It shouldn't matter if you've taken on dairy grazers. So that's pretty much where beef and lamb is coming from. You're welcome to ask me more about this. It's going to be part of your life moving forward because you are going to be getting a new plan. I think that the provisions you see in these plan changes, plan changes one and eight, will probably be carried over to your new plan. So, the more you can get right now, the better for you. Otherwise, it's going to get harder and harder. If you want to know about it, just ask a North Canterbury farmer. They'll tell you all about it.
So part C is policies once again. And part C looks at um, Im implementation of good management practices. So that's GMP that I was talking about when we were looking at the oval pit. And this is pretty much a copy and paste from Canterbury. A lot of what we're seeing in the omnibus plan change is copy and paste from Canterbury. I think um, on the one hand, um, Canterbury has done a lot of uh, good promotion in terms of uh, what, it's, what it's put forward in its plans. I think uh, as far as I understand, the person who um, helped uh, with the architecture of the Canterbury plan is currently helping Otago. That's what I understand. So that might have something to do with it. They want to see the progressive exclusion of livestock from water bodies. So think about what that means for, for you guys. What you and Otago have told me in the past is that reticulating your water supply for stock is a bit of a joke because you get minus 15 degree frosts. So if you have to exclude your stock and you can't reticulate, how are you going to get water to your stock? Also, if you have to uh, exclude your stock and you're in a country where um, it's not easy to fence, the fences get washed out a lot, or you simply cannot afford to do that kind of fencing, you need to start thinking about these things because this is now your policy toilet life. Um, you'll be seeing more of me. I'm sorry about that. Now, they're also looking at winter grazing standards and they're looking at setbacks and bare ground restrictions because uh, fallow ground is becoming very um, unpopular. They don't want to see that anymore. Critical source area identification and management is also going to be a big part of your life coming, moving forward. And I would actually embrace that um, because this is a way for you as the dry sock sector to really manage the main sources of phosphorus and nitrogen in future. Talk to your extension managers for help on this. Talk to Nicola for help on this because they have a huge amount of resources and they do do a lot of workshops around this kind of thing. So they can help you. Um, they've deleted some definitions because, and the reasoning that they've given is because they don't appear anywhere else in the plan. We might also see these definitions come through the freshwater package when it lands before elections. So, um, in terms of rules which will probably affect you, they are putting in winter grazing rules. And this is also a copy and paste. It's a copy and paste from part of the rules that have just gone through for the OTOP subregion in Canterbury, which is that they want to limit um, winter grazing to a total of 10% or 100 hectares of your land area, depending on which is smaller. And so if you keep it to that small amount, then you're probably gonna be permitted if you can't, you're going to need a recess consent for a discretionary activity. You also need to have no grazing, no basic, basically no uh, winter grazing in the um, CSAs, the critical source areas. And they want you to follow GMP in that they um, want stock to be progressively fed from top to bottom of slope. However, they haven't said you need to follow GMP necessarily. They've said we want you to graze from top to bottom. And so I understand that this is a bit of a hot topic with farmers because you guys have animal health or you have practicality issues associated with grazing top to bottom. And some people do graze from one side to the other for a certain reason and they put in measures to manage this. However, because this says you must feed top to bottom instead of saying you must follow good management practice, unfortunately, those options are out of the question for you if you want to be a permitted activity. So you need to think about how you'd make that work for you, for you and whether you could actually live with that because otherwise you need to ask for that to be changed. They also want a 10 meter vegetated setback, which is not grazed, including by sheep, between the intensive grazing area and any water body. Now be aware that it says intensive grazing, which means that it could include grazing at any time of the year, not just winter grazing. And if you can't meet any of these, you need a resource consent. So winter gra or intensive grazing, they've used pretty much the same definition as Canterbury and as the freshwater package, which is that it's any grazing by any stock on brassicas, fodder beet, and root vegetables. So no, it doesn't include your pastures or your cereals or your oats, none of that. Just those vegetables and brassicas. So you probably think this sounds a bit familiar because you've seen it in the freshwater package stuff. Some of it is familiar. 
Now, some of it is kinder than what the freshwater package has proposed. And some of it is not as kind. For example, the freshwater package was saying five meter or 20 meter vegetated setback and your plan change is proposing 10 meter setback. Um, however, this one says, follow strategic grazing principles and yours just says top to bottom. So there's, there are some similarities. At the end of the day, when the freshwater package comes out, whichever one is stricter will usually apply rather than um, just your plan overruling. So that's the difference. And again, these slides will be up there, but that's the difference between what the council has proposed and what was in the freshwater package. So, um, sorry. So when you have a look at these rules, um, if you're someone who can cope with this kind of thing, read the section 32 report if you want to understand why they've done something. Now, when I said that that 10% or 100 hectares is a copy and paste from an area in Canterbury, um, the way that they arrived at those numbers, because they're very specific numbers, the way that they arrived at those numbers is, okay, well, there's this much nitrogen in the water and we need to take this much out and we can expect this much being leached from the land. So if we restrict the winter grazing by that much, that will achieve this result. In this case, that kind of modeling hasn't been done. Not from what I can see anywhere, and especially not in the timeframes with which um, this particular plan change was put together. So that does suggest that actually um, there might be some room to find a solution which works for you. I don't know what proportion of you guys have um, in winter grazing and how much of it of your land is in it yet. I have to ask my economist to help me with that. But you need to think about your system and how that would work for you. Part E is around stock exclusion. And on its face, you might not feel like this will affect the dry stock sector because they want all dairy cattle to be excluded from water bodies, including rivers that are wider than a meter, and they want a five meter setback. So the freshwater package was also talking about a five meter setback, and they were also talking about one meter rivers. So this doesn't dif differentiate between topography or stocking rate. This is dairy cattle. And dairy cattle doesn't just mean cows that are in the middle of milking, and it doesn't mean cows that have been dried off. It doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean cows that will be used for milking. It means cows which are, rele are relevant to the dairy sector, basically. So you're talking about bulls as well. And um, driving around uh, Northern Southland yesterday, I was seeing quite a few Jersey bulls on sheep and beef land. And I thought, well, I suppose they're Southland. Um, it includes weaned and unweaned calves. So if you're raising calves and heifers, for the dairy sector, they count. And if they're on your hill country, guess what? You've got a waterway or you've got a river more than one meter, you need a five meter setback to exclude those cattle, which means it's pretty much um, excluding yours, I suppose, in the future as well. So if you do do any kind of support to the dairy sector in this way, or if your bulls are for dairy breeding, then you need to start thinking about this and how this will affect your, um, your system, because you will have to start looking at that for, um, excluding stock. We get on to part F, and this is around sediment traps. And now sediment traps um, uh, are probably something that are coming more and more into fashion. I know for some people, they used to call them stock water ponds, and now they call them sediment traps. Depends on which one is more in fashion at the time. And sediment traps are a really great way for you to capture um, that, that uh, phosphorus and sediment loss from your system in certain areas. This, what, this rule change will basically require you to exclude sheep from them. So this might or might not be a problem for you, depending on whether or not you use them for stock water. Again, you know, looking at uh, takes from waterways, if you aren't able to do that, or if you uh, aren't able to reticulate water, maybe you rely on these particular um, spots. And um, if you think that you are fine with uh, fencing them off to your sheep in future, then that's one thing. If you're not okay with that, you might want to start looking into it. Sediment traps might become more and more of a requirement on farm to manage your, um, your uh, losses. So this might become relevant to you in the future. Now, um, that's pretty much the plan change detail. I'm sorry for going through it so fast. I'm sure your heads must be just aching at the moment, but I needed to get through it fast because we don't have a huge amount of time. Now, what can you do about this? And really what you can do 
is make a submission on the plan change. So we're going to do a poll now, with um, which Nicola is going to be doing, um, on how on where you would like help with your submissions. Because I have more in this presentation, but she's just messaged me to say I've got five minutes left because I I talk too much, and the polls just popped up on my screen, which I don't want. So submissions are due by 5 p.m. on the 17th of August. You have to send them into both the EPA and ORC. And it shouldn't be too hard. I'm happy to help you. We've got resources. It is quite hard to find all the documents like the plan change and the submission forms on the EPA website. So if you see that link that I put up here, um, we've got all of the links in one document. And I've also put the actual um, plan changes and submissions onto the website for you to just download so that it's, it's easy for you. Submissions are not hard. Basically, you need to say, this is the provision. I oppose it or I support it. And then you need to say why. And you can tell them how it will affect you because they tend to not really know. Um, when I was talking to the council, as far as they were concerned, plan change eight was not going to affect the dry stock sector. And then you need to tell the EPA what you want instead. You could say, I want it deleted. You could say, please change these words. So let um, Nicole, Nicola and uh, Laura know if you want help, because I'm happy to help you if that's in a, um, another webinar or if that's in a, a group where I help you with um, your questions and your, your own personal submissions. If you want help with your own submission, even if it's help formatting, I'm happy to do that. Um, and the EPA, we have to use the EPA submission template. It's not like, the, it's not the best template, but it's not the worst. Basically, they've got three boxes and they say, what are you submitting on? What is your view on the plan change or the specific parts? And what decision do you want the Environment Court to make? Because the Environment Court is going to, as far as I understand, is making the ultimate decision, not the EPA. So once again, you say the specific provision, and then you say why, and then you say what you want instead. So we'll just have a quick look at, um, at sorry, Nicola, and sorry, everybody online. I'll just go back through there. Can everyone see that now? Mm -hmm. Yep, cool, sorry. Don't leave this again, Laura. Okay, so the first two pages, housekeeping, third page, housekeeping. Fourth page is tick the box. Fifth page, you are not a trade competitor, right? The next section is, what are you submitting on? That's the first box. What is your view? That's the second box. And what decision do you want the court to make? That's the third box. And then here is the part where you say, I do wish to be heard in support of my submission. So this all comes back to, what are you submitting on? What is your view? What decision do you want made? So again, if you want to understand, um, what level or not you would like to sort of make pitch your submissions at. Um, the plan changed seven submissions from Beef and Lamb, and I think it was, well, I think we split, submitted on behalf of the deer industry as well, um, are online now. Again, it doesn't need to be that fancy, all that stuff in the front, you don't have to worry about that for this, it's absolutely fine. And I do have a slide on um, technical and general advice, which some of you might have seen before, either with the freshwater package or with indigenous biodiversity. We're not gonna get into that now because we do not have time because I've talked too long, but I'm happy to do this for you another time if you have indicated to Nicola that you want it. If you want some help, if you have questions, if you want something explained, please feel free to email me. I haven't given you my phone number because I don't always have reception, but I'm happy to answer your emails and that way it gives me a chance to think about stuff before I respond. If you want to talk about climate change, please, for the love of all things nice, do not ask me. Um, ask Dylan, he loves this stuff. Um, if you want winter grazing advice for technical things or you want to talk about catchment groups, Tom Orchester is your beef and lamb guy. Otherwise, talk to Laura Lake and Olivia Ross for pretty much everything. Um, they do winter grazing stuff, the carbon workshops. They're great resources for good management practice and um, for farm practices and for LEPs and FEPs. FEPs might be your best friends in the future because um, if you're already working, if you're already managing your problems on farm, then there's no reason for the council to be getting involved. If you need uh, deer specific support, Lindsay um, Fung 
has helped to advertise this particular event and uh, you are welcome to ask him any questions. Now, I'll put this onto questions next. If you think that um, there is someone else that you know who should have been tuned in today, I'm actually gonna be in middle March on Tuesday, so you can send them along then and I'll be retelling the toilet story. So do we have questions, uh, Nicola or Laura? Nicola's got them. We've just got a couple, um, Lauren. The first one was referring to the discussion around winter grazing. So mm -hmm. if the NES says 50 hectares and talks about slope for winter grazing, will the Otago Regional Council need to ch change this plan again? Also, some of the NES says it happen, uh, has to happen from 1st of July 2021. How does this relate to plan change eight? Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. So the freshwater package, the NES, they are specific ab about being winter grazing and they're specific about the time frames. Whereas the plan change that Otago Regional Council has proposed is not specific about time frames so much, uh, not in the definition, and um, they don't call it winter grazing as such. They call it intensive grazing. So it could technically be at any time of year, if you're able to grow fodder beet in summer, then could be fodder beet in summer if you're feeding them on a root vegetable. I don't know, it says root vegetable. So if you're feeding them on carrots, um, that would be kept. So technically I expect that um, the council wouldn't have to change the plan because that would capture all the rest of the stuff that the freshwater package doesn't capture. However, if it comes down to the same time of year that you're looking at it, remember that the stricter rules will apply. So in this case, you probably be looking at the freshwater package rules applying. Does that answer the question? I think so, yes. Yep. Um, the other one was, I think, with reference to the earlier slides on the rubbish pits, um, plan change one, who decides what good farming practice is um, and what it looks like? Yeah, yeah, that's a really tough one. Um, so there are some booklets out on what is good management practice. And usually um, what plans do is they just refer to the industry agreed standards of good management practice. These tend to be quite vague, actually. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because you do need flexibility from region to region. I'm sorry, but Central Otago and South Otago are not the same planets. Um, what it's come down to in some areas where they've had GMP for a while is that you get particularly experienced people to make calls on stuff. And so obviously putting your rubbish in your offal pit is not good management practice. But when you're looking at grazing top to bottom versus grazing side to side, given all the various factors, it would be a matter of the very experienced person, um, you know, contracting to the council, for example, making a call on it. That's what we've come down to because, uh, for example, and I'm sorry to keep talking about Canterbury, but because we're looking at a bit of a cut and paste, this is your reference point. In Canterbury, you've got your farm environment plans and you've got your consents and you need to be audited regularly by an experienced person to make sure that you're sticking to them. And so the auditor guidance says, okay, well, these are examples of good management practice, but obviously you would need to talk to the farmer and understand why they're doing what they're doing. If it's gonna achieve the same good or the best possible environmental result that they can, then that's what you would go, go with, even if maybe it's not necessarily, you know, on paper what you'd first off recommend. Cool. Um, just a couple of other questions, again, back to winter cropping. If people are looking at possibly needing a resource consent, is there any indication or you might have some thoughts yourself around what will be required? Is it going to be difficult to gain one? Um, and how often you might need to apply? Are we talking every winter or every five years covering the next five years kind of thing? Um, costs and that sort of thing? Do you have any so ideas? Which Sorry, which consent is this? For um, winter grazing, if winter they grazing. don't meet the criteria. Yep. If they don't meet the, the criteria. Um, I don't recall what the consent duration was. I'm not sure that they actually specified what the consent duration was, or it will refer back to existing consents in that area. 
Um, what the trend is at the moment is to not give anything above a 10 year resource consent. And that is the trend around, um, uh, around the country at the moment because they need to provide for intergenerational justice. You would then need to apply for a new one coming up. You can rely on um, it just rolling over and there might be changes to it. There were more parts to your question. Yeah, there, there were, it was more just around how onerous is this going to be? Is it going to be something that people need to do every year if they're exceeding that area, which the ORC has specified? Or are they going to be able to apply for a number of years? You know, is this going to be an onerous yeah. and cost process going forward? You might be able to apply for a number of years. Um, I guess the thing is, I don't think that's a blank check for you to then take up as much as you want or just book yourself to be able to do as much as you want and then not actually do it because they will require you to actually, um, you know, do, do the thing in order to keep the recent consent. Um, the conditions of the recent consent are probably where it's going to come into being a bit problematic. And if we do see a copy and paste continue from Canterbury, having the recent consent is not necessarily a good thing because what we're seeing now is that people who have recent consents for farming land use are getting captured by other rules which require them to make reductions regardless of, you know, whether or not they need to make reductions. So um, they're becoming a bit of a liability with these resource consents. Mm, okay. Um, and the last one was with regard to the river width for the stock exclusion. Yeah. Um, how is that measured? And are we just talking about fencing the parts of the river that are one metre wide? Um, do you have any ideas on that? Okay, so if I can, am I still sharing my screen? No. Uh, okay. No. So I want to share my screen to show you the definition because that was a good question and I put it in there, but I didn't talk about it at the time. So one, one meter wide at any point within the boundary and, and that's at its annual fullest flow. So it hasn't flooded, but that's at its annual fullest flow. And if we're going by um, the freshwater package standards, where you measure that setback would be from where the water touches at its fullest flow, fullest flow five meters from that. Right, yep. Am I answered the question? Yes. Okay. Yep. So um, that is the end of the questions as far as I can see, and um, there will be another opportunity to ask questions of Lauren tomorrow if you join her Facebook yeah. live session, which I'll mention shortly. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to wrap up now. I'm aware we've gone slightly over time, so apologies for that, but I think that was some really good content. Um, so thank you very much, Lauren, for talking us through all that stuff. I think you've made it um, relatively easy to understand where otherwise it wouldn't have been. Um, thank you, if you're from, Sorry. No, I said thank you. Oh, um, if you want more information about Plan Change H, um, we'll provide those links via the Facebook page as well. If you want to tune in to Lauren's Facebook live session tomorrow, it will be at 8 a.m. and you need to go to the Beef and Lamb Southern South Island Facebook page to see that. Um, there will also be a workshop at, in the Middle March Hall next Tuesday, the 4th of August, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. if you want to ask questions live in person. Um, we'll put all those resources mentioned on the Central Otago Farming for Profit Facebook page after this event, so um, you can access them 